Gill-led survey called the Inuit Health Survey, in which the Amundsen uh, uh, Coast Guard, the icebreaker, was essentially leased out and retrofitted to be a lab. Uh, it went to 36 communities over the two years, uh, and it engaged with more than 3,000 people. And it was a large, large cross-sectional survey of Inuit health in the Arctic. So, uh, before I describe my role, my role is very limited, uh, but before I describe my role, I just wanted to point this out, is that the way that we assess exposures to mercury is by linking surveys with biomarkers. So surveys meaning asking people how much fish they ate, how much country food they ate, and trying to link that with the amount of mercury we measure in blood, hair, or urine. And we use these two as diagnostic tools to then make decisions on exposure and ultimately in population health. Uh, and because of that, there's a really well thought out, well reasoned risk assessment process in which if you plug in a number here, you're gonna get this number out here, and that's what decision makers use to come up with the bar charts that I showed you earlier, what percentage of the population is at risk versus not. If we take the numbers from Inuit and plug them into those equations, the numbers don't spit out what we would measure, okay? So this was done on a data set a couple of years ago on an old data set in which uh, from this uh, population in uh, uh, Nunavik in northern Quebec, uh, they calculated how much mercury is in the foods being consumed, how much of these foods, so the fish and the marine mammals and so on and so forth are being consumed. And based on that, the, the, the risk assessors could then figure out or calculate how much mercury is in the air. And what they calculated is that there should be 20, almost 20 parts per million of mercury in the air. It's a large, large number. But when they actually did the work, they measured just under four. So there's a huge discrepancy between what the risk assessments are telling us and what we're measuring. It works beautifully when you apply the numbers to the average Canadian. But what's the average Canadian anyway? There is no such thing as an average, but maybe you're the average Canadian, yes. And it's true. Most <laughs> The average Canadian, these numbers work for. And you know, if you're male versus female, there would be slight differences. Across ethnicities, there would be even greater differences. And the Inuit just stand out. Just like Japanese people do sometimes. Or Indians do, or Africans. And what we're starting to realize is that these risk assessments we've been using that have been telling us that population A or population B is at greater risk, they're kind of falling apart when you start looking inside the equations and how they're derived. And they make these great assumptions that the population is homogeneous. So this was a great paper which really started getting people thinking about this, published about a decade ago. Because uh, a lot of the variation up until this point, and still to this date, is largely focused on just trying to understand exposure in terms of ecological or dietary factors. So maybe we're not asking the right questions. Maybe people can't remember how much fish they ate, or if they did, maybe they can't tell if the fish was this small or this much, or maybe we're making an assumption as to how much mercury is in ring seal or tuna, and there's variation in that too. Genetics has been missing from this for a long, long time. And now, given that the Human Genome Project has sort of come to an end, we have all these great new tools, if you start peering deep in the genetic information, and looking at those genes that are responsible for how humans absorb chemicals, metabolize chemicals, distribute chemicals, eliminate chemicals, there's tremendous variation in these genes. So things such as metallothionine, or glutathione, or organic anion transporters, these are all things that our body has evolved. They're what we call environmentally responsive genes. Our bodies have evolved these to get rid of foreign xenobiotics. But then if you look at those genes and compare an Inuit's genotype with the, my genotype with an African's genotype, you see great, great differences. So what we really want to do is start bringing that type of knowledge into risk assessment. So we've been doing this type of work in a number of populations across the world now. And in the last year, we've been able to obtain some funding from uh, the Canadian government to actually do this with the Inuit Health Survey. Okay. So through the Inuit Health Survey, they collected <coughs> this great, rich database on contaminants, uh, diet, health, so on and so forth. And from some communities, they have consent to do genetics work. So in the end, we should have a sample size of 1,000, which is rather large for this type of work. 
And we have permission to look at about 360 polymorphisms in a number of pathways which we feel are important and help people metabolize contaminants. And I'm not at any stage to share results of this yet, but again, the goal is to really better understand how Inuit process contaminants so that we can use this knowledge to better do dietary assessments or risk assessment. Um, and this is somewhat similar to what we want to do with wildlife too, is to better understand inter-individual variation and intra-species uh, variation too. Uh, we certainly don't have the genetic tools for wildlife like we have with humans, but again, it's this idea that there are these genes and they're highly polymorphic in humans, we want to start replicating some of this with some of the wildlife assets and resources that we do have. So, uh, I'm going to conclude with a couple of remarks and uh, when uh, I was brainstorming a title with Renee, I just kept on coming back to these buzz terms, which I, just, I suppose it's a lot of hand waving, but maybe not. So I thought I should do my best to try to wrap up by coming back to a couple of these integrative terms like eco-health or traditional knowledge or sentinels. So let's start with sentinels. And sentinels have been defined by the National Research Council in the U.S. as animal systems that potentially warn of health hazards to humans or other animals. And we've known this for a long time that wildlife do provide integrated information on the types of contaminants that an ecosystem might be exposed to, the amounts, the availability, so on and so forth. So we use wildlife as sentinels of ecosystem health. And in some ways, when you look at the human health literature, especially in toxicology, studies are done with humans that are epidemiological studies, and they're supported by studies on rats which have helped a lot over the years in improving understanding of what chemical A, B, and C does. But there's also a tremendous amount of information that we glean from wildlife, who, unlike rats, don't live in a lab. They're in the natural world, integrating multiple stressors, uh, living in common environments as people, and uh, we've seen this time and time again. So uh, there are great examples out there of wildlife serving as sentinels for human health. Uh, the ones that pop to mind is the idea of endocrine disruption. There are chemicals in the environment that cause hormonal imbalances. This was first seen in wildlife populations. In fact, first seen in wildlife populations in Great Lakes. It wasn't until about a decade ago that people started to gather similar evidence in people. Uh, for mercury, Minamata Bay comes to mind. This is a tragic poisoning event in Japan in the 50s in which hundreds of people died of mercury poisoning. A decade before people started dying of mercury poisoning in Minamata Bay, there were cats that were dying, there were birds that were dying, there were mice that were dying, there were fish that were dying, and townsfolk observed this. Those animals were serving as sentinels for what was to come to humans. So then when we look at the polar bear data, it is a warning of changes or effects to Inuit. There are things we can do with polar bears that we can't with people. So when we peer deep inside polar bear tissues, which we cannot do with humans, there are things that myself and colleagues have been able to see that we just can't do with humans. But on the other hand, humans, we can ask them questions, and you can get clinically relevant outcomes and measures. So there must be a way to sort of marry these two uh, bits of uh, uh, information together. Uh, traditional knowledge uh, is this idea that there is this cumulative body of knowledge, especially in Aboriginal indigenous cultures, which have been developed over centuries by people. There's an extended history to this that spans generations in which the interaction of people with their natural environment directly speaks to uh, current conditions and how people should uh, live. And what indigenous groups around the world state and uh, I've been working with too many indigenous groups, but in Africa and Central America and the Arctic and the Great Lakes, every single one talks about this great connection between Mother Earth and people. And they all mention that if Mother Earth is contaminated, so will people. And they all have these observations on changes in the environment that were far, they were seen much, much earlier than what scientific evidence has shown us. For any work in northern Canada, traditional knowledge must be integrated into the work. So I've been back in Canada for a year and a half. 
uh, starting to get immersed in some of the work in the Arctic, and I'm just amazed that uh, the rich knowledge and the rich engagement that uh, various Inuit and Northern populations have in the research. And uh, when I was here a decade ago, uh, there was a fair bit of work being done in the Arctic, but I really think in the last decade there's been tremendous uh, growth in capacity for Northerners to do Northern research, and I think that it's a really good sign for, for this country. And I don't really want to talk about this, but uh, I've been having this discussion with a few people that this idea of traditional knowledge as being this form of memory which has been passed on for generations and is shaped by the environment doesn't sound that different from epigenetics. And uh, we've been just toying around with the idea of how these things might be similar and what they mean and is there an epigenetic basis for certain bits of traditional knowledge and how do we characterize and study that. So if anyone has any ideas and wants to pursue that further, there are a few of us that are just trying to wrap our heads around this. And then eco-health. Eco-health is a principle which has its genesis in Montreal about 15, 20 years ago, largely coming out of the group at UConn. And it explores changes in human health as they're driven by biological factors, physical factors, social and economic. Today I've largely focused of a biological factor in terms of human health, but it's much more complex than this. And the fact that Arctic is contaminated, traditional foods are contaminated, it's not a black and white issue. It may have been 30, 40 years ago when this was first discovered, and then the immediate response was to tell people to stop eating country foods. And that was a public health nightmare, because people stopped living off the land, they started to get foods in other ways, and that was sort of the beginning of this recent surge we've seen in obesity, diabetes, so on and so forth. And many people do believe is that the public health messaging of 20, 30 years ago, largely driven by observations of gross contamination, led to a lot of the health effects we see now today. The problem is, is that it's really hard to balance the risks and benefits of contaminants like mercury. Once people know that their foods are contaminated with mercury, more often than not they err on the side of caution, they're not going to eat it. What we've learned more recently in epidemiological studies is that it's better to eat the contaminated food than not. Because that contaminated food is a major source of essential elements, fatty acids, and things that are just good for you, good for your heart, and good for your brain. However, when it comes to actually spreading that message, most people err on the side of caution. And, in fact, uh, much of my work is focused on mercury, and mercury is found in a number of items that we deem critical for public health, like vaccines. There's been a huge uproar over vaccination in the last month, and I think a lot of that confusion was led because of initial observations that there might be so mercury in vaccines causing autism. Mercury is found in compact fluorescent light bulbs, those squiggly bulbs which are supposed to fix our energy problem. Dental amalgam, seafood. So a lot of the work that I actually do is, is to try to help balance the risks and benefits of mercury in these products. So I have just a couple more minutes and I wanted to transition from my work to a graduate program that we're trying to launch here back to my work. So. Um, a couple of us joined McGill over the last year or two that do contaminants work. So there are folks in epidemiology, toxicology, experimental medicine that have come together recently realizing that we now have critical mass at McGill to do contaminants work again. And we're trying to teach our students to do this work in isolated silos. And we need to bring them together. So we're in the midst of launching a graduate option in environmental health sciences. Uh, the course is going to start next academic year. It's going to be a course that uh, spans toxicology, epidemiology, risk assessment, and environmental sciences and risk assessment. Uh, the core of the program will be two graduate level courses that will be spread over fall and winter. Three credits in the fall, three in the winter. Half of the course will be online, and then half of the course will be together. And on top of that, there's going to be a symposia series and also a fall symposia. So stay tuned, I'll get the information to biology somehow. And the founding units are listed there, but there are folks, faculty, and students from across a number of units that want to join in on the program. So we're just trying to better understand how options uh, are managed here at McGill 
and how to be inclusive and allow uh, other units and faculty and their students to get involved. So again, if anyone's interested in contaminants or you know of others that are, and students want training in this area, you can talk to me. And then I just wanted to mention that I talked about the work in the Arctic, which is indicated with a star, but that's just one area in which I work. And I present this just in case there are folks that do work in the Great Lakes or in West Africa, because that's where a number of our other projects are. So this idea of studying wildlife and people, we do in the Arctic, but I would say our activities in the Great Lakes with uh, 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 animals like mink and bald eagles and loons, but also indigenous groups across the Great Lakes, and also in West Africa are ones that we focus more on these days. So if there are folks that study in those geographical zones on common issues, I'd be glad to talk. And again, since this is the first time that I'm in this department talking, I thought I'd quickly just give a plug of our work. So again, our main focus is to uh, develop, apply, and use ecosystem-based approaches to solve issues in environmental health. We focus on contaminants that come from natural resource uh, uh, extractive type industries. Uh, much of my work is comparative, meaning we study humans and fish and wildlife, and we try to integrate results at a cellular level all the way up to populations. Um, and my formal training is in ecotoxicology, that's what I've been doing a lot until now, but after spending a number of years in the U.S. in the School of Public Health, I've been doing more environmental epidemiology. Moving ahead, I imagine my epidemiology and human health work will always be about three quarters of a portfolio and a quarter will be ecotox. And with that, uh, I'll take any questions that you might have.